picking up with our next panel session, the rise of real time in payments. And we're getting our money's worth out of Chetan Parekh this morning because he's back on stage again to moderate the panel. Chetan, over to you. Morning, everyone, again. Uh, thanks for listening in to me. So the next panel is a very, very interesting panel as I spoke in the morning. So it's a rise of the real-time payments. And we have some very, very senior bankers and leaders in the room. So let me first start, invite my esteemed panelists. I'll start with Vibor Mundada. Vibor is the CEO of Mashrak Neopay. <laughs> Vibor has a led industry in a very big way over the last 15 years. He's been a leader in the payment space and a chief executive at the NeoPay, which is one of the first regional payments leader. Vibor is also chairman of the Payments and Acquiring Committee and carries a deep amount of banking and payments experience right from city to Mashrak to NeoPay. Let me go with my second panelist member. Uh, let me invite Sandeep Chauhan. Sandeep is Group Chief <laughs> Business Transformation Officer for Network International. Sandeep is uh, three decades in tier one banks, right from city to Mashrak to regional commercial bank. And his last position was uh, acting chief executive of Abu Dhabi Islamic. He's a a vivid and a thought leader in transformation space. So it'll be very, very interesting, Sandeep, to listening to you. Very warm welcome. My next speaker is Jem Sardamir. Jem is at SWIFT. He heads regional cross-border payments uh, for Middle East, Africa, and subcontinent. He is doing some very interesting work at SWIFT. Many of us know that ISO is coming in a big way as his messaging format and some of the innovation linked to SWIFT GPI and the next generation payments. My last but not the least panelist is a lady Priyanka Saroop from Oracle. Uh, Priyanka is a leader in global transaction banking payments and trade business. Uh, she has been a two decades banker and transaction banker leading uh, first Abu Dhabi Bank uh, in payment space. And my uh, fellow panelists, I'd like to invite Rizwan Sheikh from Explio. Rizwan uh, leads sales for Explio Group. Very, very warm welcome, Rizwan. So let me start first of all with Vibor. And as all of us know, many countries in the Middle East is transitioning towards instant payments, which is a major area. And today's consumers expect instant payments the way they have experienced in some of the more matured markets. So what do you think are the most important trends, Vibor, driving this whole instant payments? And also, if you can just explain us what exactly instant payments mean? Because many of us call 60 second payments in instant payments. And how do you see this opportunity in shape and size? Sure. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, if you see instant payments, as you said, uh, multiple markets instant payments are growing. And instant payments essentially would mean uh, uh, not 60 seconds, but uh, within a couple of seconds or three or four seconds, the uh, payment is credited into either uh, the benef credited into the beneficiary who could be a consumer, which is a, a peer to peer instant payment or a lot of use cases are being built around merchants in markets like India, for example, where a lot of work has been done where merchant payments are also uh, increasingly moving towards the instant payment rails uh, powered obviously by UPI. I'm, everyone knows about UPI use cases across multiple merchant segments, right? So, so that essentially is what instant payments is. And in the region, uh, 
a lot of work is happening in the UAE. We are already in pilot. Mashrek Neope is one of the uh, banks that is already in pilot in phase one with the instant payment uh, 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 product of the central bank. Uh, what drives instant payment, I think, is uh, so there are two two aspects of it, right? There are there are countries where uh, you know instant payments have really picked up. Countries like India or China, where uh, traditionally card penetration was uh, pretty low versus, uh, you know, countries like UAE where the card penetration probably is one of the highest in the world. And in some places, instant payment just leapfrogged the innovations that were happening in cards. Uh, for example, stuff like x or which essentially means that you use a mobile phone to make payments by tapping a phone today, which is pretty relevant in GCC and the UAE. But in certain countries, uh, that evolution took time and Payments like UPI or Alipay, WeChat Pay in, in, in China, for example, leapfrogged that evolution of cards and hence use cases were built around it. Uh, what does it mean for uh, us here? I think uh, UAE is already a, a pretty carded market, as I said. Uh, people have already moved towards uh, using contactless and XPays. Uh, some stats, if you see today, 90% of transactions on merchants are happening on contactless. Uh, in terms of transaction, number of transactions. And out of those 90%, almost 60% are coming through x today. So people are already used to using mobile phone and using a mobile phone to pay. And I think when the instant payments will pick up, that, that user experience of uh, you know, doing a transaction using a phone would already uh, come in. Uh, the success factors for the UAE in particular in the region, in my opinion, is uh, you know, one is ease of use. Uh, how good the customer experience is for, and there are two use cases obviously, and we have lead, you know, people uh, talking about consumer payments, which is a big thing that will end up in that is how, how close or how frictionless is the user experience for the consumer to make a transaction. That will determine how much adoption is at the consumer and hence how, how merchants perceive this and how merchants pick it up. And my belief is there's a lot of uh, work will happen on the B2B space as well where, uh, you know, security, uh, specific use cases, etc., will drive that. Uh, so we are already working uh, with the central bank and uh, uh, we would be having instant payments as a method of acceptance for our merchants as well. Excellent. Thank you so much, Vibor. Uh, very interesting. Frictionless and the change in the consumer behavior is going to be driving it. Next, moving it to Jem, uh, you know, at when you look at the payments, there's a whole B2C and a B2B. But one thing which is common is paying cross-border. And that's traditionally being always a complex thing because you don't have a control over the whole beneficiary and the speed of the payments. Mm -hmm. Especially UAE being an expat-driven country where significant flows are to the global economy. How do you see the cross-border payments in terms of the readiness as well as interoperability. Yeah. So um, to start with, I think low-value payments, especially on cross-border payments, is a growing market where uh, the trends, the technological innovations, plus the competition is driving both financial institutions or fintechs to offer better end users experience on cross-border payments. And you also mentioned, as we, we are an expat country here, it's inevitable to offer a better user experience on cross-border payments, both on the retail segment for person-to-person -person payments or remittances, and for SME payments or, let's say, B2C or B2B payments. So if I take it from SWIFT's perspective, so SWIFT began its mission by 1973, and since then, uh, we're trying to revolutionize the cross-border payments landscape. And the ultimate goal of SWIFT is to offer instant and frictionless cross-border payments, account-to-account, -account, anywhere in the world. So maybe to mention a couple of key milestones. So in 2017, SWIFT launched GPI solution, which means Global Payments Innovation. And it was the first, let's say, big step uh, through the instant and frictionless cross-border payments journey. And as of today, 90% of cross-border payments are on GPI rails, where we see that 47% of the global 
cross-border transactions are happening in less than five minutes. So, which is very good, but not enough. So, when we look at all of the transactions, although we see 95% of cross-border payments on globe are happening less than in a day, uh, we think we should uh, get things beyond that. So, on top of the success of GPI, two years ago, Swift uh, launched some other value-added services to reach that instant and frictionless target. So, for low-value payments, uh, we started offering Swift Go to, let's say, enable more predictable, much faster and easier cross-border payments, especially on low-value payments. And we started offering solutions such as pre-validation, where banks are enabled to validate the credentials of end beneficiaries before they initiate the transaction. Therefore, uh, we can get rid of any potential frictions on the way. So when we look at the speed uh, for low value payments, on Swift Go transactions, what we see is 80% of transactions are happening in less than five minutes. So, um, which, is, which is very good, actually. And on top, the, the median transaction uh, is, or the time that has passed is two minutes and 30 seconds. But we need to have it globally standard for everyone, and Swift Go is instant where available. So where the correspondent bank can connect the local market infrastructure, which is instant and 24-7 available, that means Swift Go is instant as well. So the fastest transaction that we have experienced is, for instance, 22 seconds end-to-end. -end. So this should be the standard for entire low-value payments. This is what we believe. And in order to happen, make this happen, uh, the third layer is, as you mentioned, when you introduce uh, the ISO migration. So by November 2025, every single financial institution is up to initiate a data-rich message, a standardized message, that will increase the straight-through processes and decrease the frictions. And lastly, maybe to mention one more external driver, uh, it is the G20 targets. So Financial Stability Board put some targets for G20 countries, which are accepted. And as of 2027, um, the, the cross-border transactions between G20 countries must happen in a day, 100%. This is, this is the first target. And 75% of them must happen in uh, an hour. So this is also another motivator for SWIFT and its community to uh, go through the instant and frictionless cross-border journey. And when you look at the challenges with this mm -hmm. kind of innovation over the last five years for SWIFT, what do you see are the pain points or the challenges? Yeah, so maybe I can answer it from two perspectives. From community readiness perspective, uh, as I mentioned, for the last legs of the payment, we are pretty much, let's say, bound to the capabilities of the local market infrastructures. So the more we have instant and 24-7 local market infrastructures, means the more corridors we can achieve that instant and frictionless cross-border payments. And on top, there are some inevitable issues such as KYC checks, rules and regulations in certain countries such as currency controls, etc. That will be a challenge to achieve globally that target as well. And from end user's perspective, I can also take that question. So uh, when we, we had a recent research as SWIFT, uh, and what we have realized is that mainly for retail and SME customers of the banks, uh, there are some pain points yet to be solved, such as hidden fees, uh, complexity of fee structures, and the frictions on the way which would lead unsuccessful payments. So when you initiate a payment, maybe in, in one hour, two hours, the end beneficiary bank will receive it, but because of the incorrect information, maybe there's an account name mismatch, there's another thing, uh, the transaction may require some exception and investigation or there can be some rejection so that it can take maybe um, more than two hours or days even to, to complete the transaction. So these are the pain points from an end user perspective to be solved. Thank you so much, very interesting. So I'll move to Sandeep. Sandeep uh, as real-time payments are emerging, 
and technology can make a huge difference. So from a bank or a payment provider perspective, uh, for streamlining the customer journey or providing them user with a frictionless experience as Vibor mentioned, what should banks do or what technologies they should deploy? Assalamu alaikum and uh, <coughs> morning. You know, when a customer from South Africa, let's say Cape Town comes to Dubai and uses their card, a transaction from here flies from Dubai Mall through a Visa network or a MasterCard network all the way down to Cape Town gets authorized and then makes the whole journey back. If you're in the real-time payment business, this transaction happens in 300 milliseconds, the whole thing, the full round trip. That is the current state of technology. The people, the organizations that are cracking this capability are winning the consumer payment battle. You'll be surprised that in the last three years, the disruptors in payments, the current incumbents or the previous incumbents being banks and the new incumbents being the disruptors, 65 percent of all consumer payments are now taking place with the disruptors are, are no longer with the banks. And this is banks that have had the unbelievable budgets to invest in technology. So to your point, what happened? What happened is compute horsepower became cheap. You could throw anything in the cloud and compute it. Telecommunication speeds, 5Gs, completely changed the paradigm of the travel. The API capabilities meant handshakes became simpler. So the rise of real-time payments, as you call it, the underlying is a complete and direct correlation of the evolution of technology that took place along a payment has remained timelessly the most attractive opportunity to, to deal with financial crime, which meant the complexity of dealing with fraud, complexity of dealing with anti-money laundering and combating you know, financial terrorism or financing terrorism, the need to ensure creditworthiness of these transactions, all these elements have remained. They have not gone away. But to be able, it is the capability of re-architecting your solutions to understand how to rev up the speed, the RPM of the engine. If you look at any car dashboard, there are two dials there. One is the speed, but the speed is the speed at which the car is moving. It is the RPM meter which tells you the speed at which the engine is moving. So the engine room really organizations that want to compete in this space need to understand the importance of the technologies. And the good news is these technologies are now reasonably available off the shelf. They are available as a service. They are available in the cloud. And they interoperate with almost all leading other elements of the ecosystem. So I'm just telling you what is table stakes today. We at Network International handle 20 million transactions a day across 50 countries with serving 300 banks. And mobile operators, and so on and so forth. The disruptors, if you don't understand the technology the disruptors are putting, and who is the biggest disruptor in payments today? Is the telecom provider. Is the retail marketplace. 
and in our own backyard a taxi service called kareem not a bank so the advent of wallets further while all this was going on given the complexity of security we had tokenization come along so so the wider point is that the the evolution of technology is timeless and will continue it's the pace at which you can embrace it into your ecosystem and stay go closer to the the open banking standards that will help you continue to win the battle thank you thank you sir very very interesting insights and a different perspective altogether so moving to uh, uh, again rizwan to you and from a partner and a fintech providers perspective uh, to deliver an end to end experience on next gen payment it is so important uh, to create a strong partnership between the bank a payment processor who brings innovation and a fintech so what do you believe is the unique innovation which this combination can bring to ensure a great frictionless payment so thank you chetan first of all thank you sudha for having me on as, as part of this panel and uh, really appreciate uh, ladies and gentlemen for listening to on to us uh, this is a very interesting question about payments right now which is uh, Uh, as xpo we normally launch bti index business transformation index year on year this year we launched and if you look at the three top elements of those report is primarily one is payments bnpl uh, and of course uh, lending so these are the three top priorities for all bankers across and that's the cash generating now if i come to payments uh, we did talk about real time payments instant payments uh, right so i don't know whether you know the instant payments is not new it was somewhere started in 1973 in japan uh, there is a system called a zenkin but unfortunately it did not pick up pace it became 24 by 7 only after 2018 right so primarily it is still new and then switzerland followed somewhere in 2018 again and uh, but then they picked up pace only after 2021 now i also wanted to bring this india context into picture here india you know that in 2016 the country went into demonetization of currency now because of which liquid cash was very difficult in those days and that kind of advent uh, complete terms into payments and it is so convenient uh, when i was in india about a week back i went in a you know auto rickshaws or we call as tuk tuks and if you have to pay you have to either pay cash or you have to use the paytms or the the barcode generators uh, payment mechanism so of course i didn't have the barcode and i suffered a lot to pay cash but then eventually i joined the bandwagon and i was able to make payments very instantly without just using my mobile phone so to answer your question uh, why is this collaboration important um, again if you look at recent development in india upi has launched an atm just now about a month a weeks few weeks back right and the first screen of the atm is i want to withdraw 500 rupees that's your first screen no card is requested no bank account details requested they don't even ask you who you are you are just inputting 500 rupees as a first input as soon as that happens the system the atm machine generates barcode a qr code sorry not a barcode and all you need to do is use your mobile phone open the upi app and uh, just scan the qr code automatically detects that who you are which bank account and you can actually choose which bank account you want to money, withdraw money because you might have multiple bank accounts and once you say yes confirm you put in your pin number the atm dispenses cash so did government of india did do it alone no it was a pure collaboration you had ncr with the atm machine you had the payment collaborators you had the banking fraternity as part of this so everybody has made this beautiful transaction happen and this is like i am not even clicking there is no click is just one input this is the money i want and we've done the payment so essentially i see five reasons why the collaboration is very important first it creates new opportunity for all the players right all of them can actually work together co-create innovate bring up new solutions possibilities examples like hsbc trade shift they are actually helping in supply chain global fire supply chain altogether you can look at city bank and stripe they've created another unique mechanism these are running examples these are success stories and it's a stripe treasury that is being offered banking as a service so many such examples exist uh, across the world today um, the second is obviously customer convenience we talked about it in the earlier panel ui ux uh, so the example of india which i gave you earlier 
it was very convenient for me to just carry my mobile phone and actually make a payment on the fly while I was traveling anywhere. So that was the best part of it. So the, it was simple, just scan, pay, and that's it. Two things and you're done. Very fast, very quick, it's instant. And, that, and the rickshaw driver, the auto rickshaw driver actually confirmed I got his payment. The payment is received. The third thing uh, is, is like, you know, uh, merged know-how. Not everybody or individual entities know everything in the payment cycle. I think Sandeep gave a fantastic example of South African gentleman coming here, swiping, whole transaction happening in 300 milliseconds. But obviously, uh, banks here need to understand how South Africa works. South Africa needs to understand how the, how the merchants work. Everything, this is a merged know-how. When they come together, everybody understands or, or share knowledge and actually go together towards a common goal. Um, the fourth thing, obviously, is in terms of customers are expecting faster, reliable, and transparent payment. So I want it immediately. And more often than not, when we transfer money to some of our friends or, or any other, we check, have you received it? Because that's the expectation. We want them to receive it immediately. So that's what the customers want. And they need to know that the whole money is got one place or another. And finally, I, I would say that because of this particular transparency requirement, the regulations have also shaped up very well in instant payment circle. And I think that is giving them a good insight in terms of uh, keeping the complete audit trail, making sure reconciliations are happening, and of course trying to avoid any kind of fraudulent transactions altogether. So these are the five uh, top reasons. I, there are many more obviously, but I'll probably restrict myself here. Thanks, Rizwan, for interesting five insights. And now I'll move to Priyanka from Oracle. And while we spoke a lot about payments, next-gen payments, B2C payments, cross-border payments, one of the biggest volume payments and value payments is corporate B2B payments. So you have looked at it from a bank's perspective, from supplier's perspective. So where do you see B2B payments changing in the digital and how they become next-gen real-time payments? And if you can also allude what is this request to pay, which is emerging as one of the key trends? Good morning, everyone. So thank you, Siddhar, for having me as part of this panel. So I think <clears throat> it's a very interesting question, uh, Chetan. And I'd like to start off by highlighting, you know, that today in the Middle East and Africa region, the B2B payments market is valued at USD 54 billion as of 2021. Now, this is expected to grow to USD 122 billion as of, you know, uh, 2030. So that means there is going to be a CAGR of 9.6% growth uh, for this B2B payments uh, market over the forecasted period. But I think these are very interesting statistics. And what is really driving this growth is the adoption of real-time payments by businesses. So that's the key factor that's driving the growth over this forecasted period. And so what we will see over the next five years is that business-to-business real-time payments is going to be the fastest growing segment in the payment space. Now, what we need to understand to sort of delve into this further is that B2B payments, they're basically categorized based on the payment mode, either into ACH payments, wire transfers, there's check, cash, and others. Now, most of these payment modes, as you, 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 you know, typically we've all uh, you know, dealt with these payment modes, they're inefficient, they're slow, and they're also generally expensive. So we find that a lot of the small and the mid-sized businesses are challenged with high processing costs, they have delays in their B2B payments, uh, and there's manual invoicing, et cetera, involved. So in order, you know, this is what is actually making this shift towards the real-time payments, is that because of that real-time settlement, what it's going to help these small and mid-sized businesses is to actually free up their working capital. So they don't need to maintain these high cash buffers that they have to do today. And also, it also gives them that flexibility to either pay or even receive payments closer to their due dates. So, um, so this is sort of setting the background in terms of the adoption and the growth that we're going to see in the B2B payment space. Now, what's important to understand is how can banks help businesses streamline their real-time payments? So one of the major ways that this can be done is by banks supporting direct integration into you know, their ERP systems or their other back office systems so that businesses can have this real-time or maybe a near real-time 
you know, insight into their payment transactions, into their liquidity positions. So this is key. And this is where, you know, financial service providers like Oracle play a major role uh, because we have built this cloud solutions to enable, you know, to accelerate banks having access to these RTP systems. Now, when we're talking about Oracle solutions in particular, these RTP payment systems, they're built using ISO 222 messaging standards. Now, what this allows the bank to enable the business is to actually automate that entire B2B transaction. So in terms of the fact that you can have now an automated matching of a purchase order to, you know, of, of, to an invoice, you can have an e-invoice for payment initiation, you can have account reconciliation for the customers, virtual services, virtual account services, et cetera. So there's a complete automation that we're looking at, which is, which is built on the back of the ISO 222 messaging standards, which the RTP systems are built on. The other way the banks can help uh, businesses adopt is, of course, to also have uh, you know, more robust controls. Given the irrevocable nature of these payments, there needs to be uh, you know, more uh, implementation of verification services. So we've seen in the UK, for example, the confirmation of pay service has you know, vastly reduced the APP fraud. So I think banks and working with solution providers such as Oracle can work on implementing these services which you know, adopt artificial intelligence, data analytics to control fraud in this space, which is also very, very critical. Um, also, I think uh, the other untapped market here is the cross-border uh, B2B payments. So I think here also there is a lot of potential for solutions uh, to exist. And uh, you know, we've seen the adoption, so in 2022, for example, the TCH, SWIFT, and the EBA Clearinghouse in Europe, they came together and formed uh, you know, an immediate cross-border uh, payments uh, clearing channel. So this is, this is something that's work in progress. We're seeing it across the globe, the adoption of this. But these are some of the um, you know, highlights or points that I'd like to share. Uh, in terms of what's driving the growth and what's, what's in the future for B2B payments. Thank you so much, Priyanka. Quite an interesting B2B insights. I'll go to Sandeep again. Sandeep, as we do the next-gen payments, the whole value-added services around authentication, around the digital verification, or anti-money laundering, or fraud, how do these technologies are evolving to support the whole next-generation payments? <clears throat> so, so let's acknowledge that the ability to move a transaction at pace is now well established. So that's current generation. Whether it is 300 milliseconds or it's three minutes, it's neither here or there. The next generation is about how you take that transaction and enrich it. So a basic transaction that is flying could get enriched in many ways, could get enriched with its geopositioning information, could get enriched with the merchant with whom you're transacting their information, number one. Number two, you need capabilities of notification. Once things are happening at pace, you need to find a way to notify all parties that this transaction is now moving at that speed. Notification allows the other parties to consume that notification in, in varying forms best known to that journey. So because the journey in, in, in a car taxi is different from what you want to do with the notification versus what you want to do in a retail purchase. Number three, how do you leverage that data for authentication? Now the payment information, the value add that you bring in, in that payment information could be you want to at that, within the 300 millisecond, take a credit decision through buy now, pay later, and allow the consumer to convert it into a credit. They may want to use the value add to convert it into a loyalty opportunity. They may want to use the value add to convert it into a cross-sell opportunity. 
that is where the next generation of enrichment is taking place in the payments ecosystem. So for all of you here, you need to understand how are you preparing your current payment platforms to engage with these new age players who are helping you do that enrichment notification and commercialization of that payment transaction. The commercialization is where the ball is moving to. Just the ability to move it in a few milliseconds, you know, I think the gentleman mentioned it happened in 1970. And you know, good to talk about UPI in India, but just go to China, it happened about 10 years ago. So it's not a big deal, it's great it's happening in our backyard. Thank you, that's my view. Thanks, Sandeep. So moving to the, again, we board to you on the next-gen payments with all innovations, everybody investing big dollars, right from a bank to a payment provider to a tech. And you've been sitting on committees for regulations. So how do you see the regulation catching up and security catching up to ensure that there isn't a unusually high fraud or fallouts? Sure, uh, that's a very interesting question and I think uh, everyone has touched upon that, right? When you talk about rise of real-time payments, real-time payments is real-time, irrevocable, right? There is, uh, you know, if you use cards, you need to understand that, you know, there is a chargeback cycle, there's a chargeback process, dispute, etc. Real-time payments are irrevocable and hence there's a lot of challenges that come in in terms of how do you handle not just security but fraud management and there's a lot of work to be done at, at the entire ecosystem level, be it the issuer, which could be potentially a bank, or it could be a super app, it could be a wallet, and on the other side, uh, you know, merchant solutions provider such as ourselves, where we'll open it up for all these millions of consumers today within the UAE, and hopefully with all the work that's happening on interoperability, at least within the region, right? So, so that's a very, very important and pertinent, uh, you know, point to be noted or to be looked at when you are building your instant payment strategy because that's pretty different from what has happened generally over the last so many years which your teams are used uh, to, right? That's an important bit. Uh, I think from a regulation or regulatory perspective, I have uh, been fortunate to, uh, you know, work with the regulator uh, as industry forum in a lot of these uh, regulations that have come in. And I, I would say that in the region in general and in the UAE where I'm much closer to it, the regulator has always been uh, forthcoming, uh, always been looking ahead. And if you see all the regulations that have come in over the past two to three uh, years are all uh, moving towards fostering uh, more collaboration, a point that has already been made. So for example, you have the retail payment service regulation. Uh, there was a lot of arbitrage available to be honest in the UAE, uh, central bank license, some other uh, free zone license, etc. And I think what, what has happened over the last two to three years is there's a lot of standardization that has happened. So for example, the retail payment service regulation clearly tells you if you want to be a wallet, what does it mean? If you want to be a merchant acquirer, what does that mean? If you want to be, you know, a, a store value of credit or, or if you want to just be a pass through, what it means? And there's standardization that has happened, right? Uh, there's a lot of work that's happening on, we, we talked about buy now, pay later, and I, I believe instant payments is going to disrupt that industry big time. Sandeep talked about decisioning uh, and, and all the stuff that can be done from a tech perspective at the moment of truth. But please remember buy now, pay later today, the collection is happening on cards, which is, uh, I mean, pretty counterintuitive. I'm giving a credit line, but I'm collecting on a card. And that comes in with a lot of challenges in terms of how do you collect it, what is the cost of collection, et cetera, et cetera. And when the real-time payments come in, a lot of those, uh, you know, aspects will be solved and hence there's a lot of play there. So the regulations that are going to come in for buy now, pay later companies as well. Already live in Saudi Arabia, Qatar announced it in September. Uh, we expect uh, uh, September Qatar announced regulation. We expect that coming into the UAE as well. So I think uh, open banking regulations are coming in. A lot of work is happening over there. And uh, the, the central bank has already uh, laid out the payment transformation charter where some of the regulations that I'm talking about are coming in. 
and others like CBDC, et cetera, are also coming in. So I think, uh, you know, the regulator is uh, looking at uh, uh, giving regulations which are transparent, fair, and that will foster uh, partnership as well as healthy competition. So, and that's what we have seen increasingly over the last two to three years. It's great, great to see that regulation is also catching up. And my next question is to the full panel. But I'll start with Priyanka yourself. Looking ahead, what do you see as a single technology or a trend that we should look out for from an next-gen payments perspective? I think for me, I think it would be the data which is created by generative AI. I think that's going to be an important trend in how it's going to improve fraud detection primarily. Okay, so that's so, data. Yes. Uh, Jem, from your perspective? Well, I think APIification will continue from cross-border payments as well. And on top, uh, Lord mentioned CBDC. So the future, in, in near future, we will see CBDC is going to be used for money movements as well. Interesting. Sandeep? <coughs> AI, I think it's uh, not just fashionable to talk about it. Um, I think artificial intelligence is here. It's finding some the appropriate application of AI in, in, in a payment uh, space, it's likely to find a little bit more in, in the area that uh, you know, Priyanka specializes because those are complex payments and they, they require the power of trade payments and you know, cash management, et cetera, is sophisticated. And that's where I think um, a lot of heavy lifting is going on and these, the, the AI capabilities uh, will, will really, in, in a few years' time, uh, radically change this. Very interesting AI. So again, Vibor, coming back to you, what do you think is one? I think I'll, I'll second to what uh, you know, the panelists have said, and, I, and it's happening, uh, AI use of data. And I think using that, use cases being built around it, be it fraud management, uh, be it value-added services like we spoke about lending, we spoke about uh, instant decisioning, et cetera. So I think uh, there's a lot of work to be done there and already started. So I think that's something that is uh, uh, what's going to Since shape. Since AI payments. again, uh, Rizwan? So although last in the cycle, of course, all the options have been taken. I have to create something new. <laughs> so anyway, I'm, a very, uh, I'm very fond of sci-fi movies, right? And uh, I would like to see the day when you go to somewhere and the payment is done, either using one of your body parts like iris scan, fingerprints, I don't know. Uh, I mean, those are the days expected. I mean, all these technologies will lead ultimately to that, so you don't need to carry anything, which in instant payment terms it is called an alias. Uh, like typical standard is, of course, bank to bank, account to account, or the alias is your mobile phone or anything else. But um, the day I just walk in and like, you know, one of these Tom Cruise movies, he walks through and he gets personalized advertisements following him all the way around, buy this, buy that. and. That's, I think they're sensing his iris scan or something like that. So I think that's where we will head towards. Excellent. Soon. Let's have as some As long questions. as we are needed to process the payments, I'm very happy <laughs> whatever happens. So. The regulators will take care. No? Let's have some, a uh, couple of audience questions and then we close. Yeah. Go ahead, Ali. Thank you. So my question was for uh, Chairman Sandeep. So with, you, you guys mentioned crypto, CBDC coming into play. What is the impact of that on the railways, like SWIFT yeah. um, and on, you know, uh, uh, vendors such as Network International in terms of if these transactions become more mainstream and even today in the UAE I can go to Imar and buy a property from crypto. So where does that leave um, you know, some of our more uh, incumbent players? Go yeah, on. maybe I can start. So once we met with blockchain or DLT technology, what was the argument? So central facilitators will move away. So uh, there is no need for a central organization. To, to connect each other, right? But what we see as of today is for CBDCs as well. So it won't be the only way to do it. And every CBDC has different type of technology behind it, although it's all based on blockchain. So there's a need of interlinkage. There's a need of interoperability, both in between CBDCs and between CBDCs and fiat currency accounts, let's say. So SWIFT is going to play the same role for a payment for instance, from a CBDC 
to another CBDC for, a, for, for another person or, or a company or for a B2B payment, as well as for money movements from a, let's say, CBDC to a um, fiat currency account. Yep. So, uh, <clears throat> handling money is very serious business. It's not Central bank, it's called CBDC for a reason. So our view is the central banks will determine the course at which CBDCs will evolve and be regulated and be commercialized or commoditized. So, yeah, the, that's what's for the serious players. Um, we will be guided eventually by the, the central banks. And, you know, central banks are in varying stages of piloting it. The digital dollar has been in, in development for five years. The digital dirham is getting developed. And, you know, we'll see pilots of that very soon. So, yeah, let's not... Uh, the consumers want to see their money being handled in a very responsible uh, manner and that's what means regulators. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much for listening in and a big thank you to the panelists uh, for amazing sharing insights.